we've got enough time. Um, so hello all uh, and welcome to our third week of the Early Career Science Scientist Symposium uh, and the second week of our Early Career Scientist Talks. Uh, my name is Ben Nicholas and I'm a second year PhD student in the Lopez Fernandez lab here at University of Michigan uh, and I'll be moderating today's session. Um, today we'll hear from three early career speakers, uh, Dr. Mikhailo, Dr. Park, and Dr. White. Um, but first, I, before I introduce our first speaker, um, I wanted to remind everyone of our format. First, we'll hear from Alexis's talk, followed by Daniel's and then Alex's. At the, each of e at the end of each talk, um, there'll be a time for a few questions. Um, at the end of all three of these talks, so around 12 or 2.30 um, p.m., we'll be switching to a panel discussion about the themes and topics related to early career science, museum collections, and natural history. Um, as a reminder, people should use the Q&A function on the bottom to ask questions either for the talks or the panel discussion. Um, you can ask that at them at any time, and we'll get to them um, when those times come up. Um, we also do have live transcripts available, which can be turned on on the bottom uh, bar in your Zoom bar. Um, and after today's rounds of talks, we'll have one more week of early career talks, followed by a closing keynote talk by Pam Soltis on April 2nd. So I'm looking forward to seeing everyone there as well. Um, so without further ado, um, uh, let me introduce our first speaker. Um, so our first speaker is Alexis Mikhailo, uh, and she works on the intersection of conservation biology and paleobiology. She uses clues from genomes, bones, and sediments to assess how organisms responded to the past anthropogenic and climate changes on scales from decades to millennia, thereby generating, le thereby generating lessons of coexistence in an increasingly human-dominated world. She received her PhD from Stanford University, where she combined excavations of quaternary deposits and surveys of endangered Caribbean mammals. She studied museum collections as a postdoctoral fellow at the Labria Tar Pits Museum, Hokkaido University, and the University of Oklahoma. Alexis is also committing to using museums to broaden participation. She developed the first Tar Pits High School Research Program in Los Angeles and has facilitated on the repatriation of Caribbean paleontological material. She will also be an assistant professor at Middlebury College in 2021, where she looks forward to cultivating a community-based natural history program. Take it away, Alexis. Thank you so much for that kind introduction and thank you to everyone who's tuning in. It is such a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Alexis and I uh, actually just started my assistant professor position at Middlebury College. So I am excited to be speaking to you from beautiful Vermont. And today I'll be telling you just a little bit about how I use natural history collections to bring new insight into conservation challenges like human wildlife conflict. So as everyone probably is aware, when we think about carnivores often in public media, usually they're portrayed almost as evil, as conniving, and really the villains in a lot of our stories. And this perception has actually translated often into the real world, seeing massive contractions of carnivores, both due to their perception, as well as potential conflicts over things like livestock and livelihoods. And this negative perception doesn't just decrease populations of carnivores, it can actually transform the way our world looks and functions. So we now know from several years of uh, ecological study that when we remove top carnivores, it not only removes those individuals, it trickles down and impacts entire ecosystems, changing vegetation structure, disease transmission, which we're all now keenly aware of, even things like carbon cycling and overall biodiversity. So knowing how to live with carnivores is incredibly important, in many different dimensions. Luckily, we've been seeing many recoveries of carnivores globally. So for example, in Europe, some carnivores after relaxation of historic hunting pressures have actually been able to slowly recover and spread back out into new areas, which also means that people living there are now experiencing carnivores in their backyards, perhaps for the first time. And I'll show you through some short stories how museum collections can actually provide both the science and stories to help us coexist with these species. That data from specimens can help us know where to put these species back if we're trying to reintroduce them and develop baselines of understanding where they should be, how many of them there should be. But also collections are independent data sets that let us really think about this idea of perception that help us test narratives of loss 
and help us understand why people were interacting with these species in the way they were. So I'll go over three brief examples, one of reintroduction, one of rewilding, and one of re-expansion. So the California grizzly bear is everywhere in California, except actually alive and roaming the landscape. Um, it's on all the flags, it's on all the tourist uh, memorabilia, you can really find it anywhere, but it was actually not seen since 1924. So it's been almost 100 years since we last had a grizzly in California. Uh, in about 2014, however, there was a petition to reintroduce grizzlies, specifically to start thinking about putting them back in this area of the Sierra Nevada here where it could be a suitable habitat. This was of course accompanied by many opinions. Um, a lot of them unfortunately were, uh, you know, I, dealing with this idea of a huge mammal walking around, potentially being a threat to people, potentially being a threat to livestock. Uh, this quote, somebody's gonna get killed. Should we have a return of a 2000 pound beast? They're gonna wander out and start attacking livestock, especially if there's no salmon to feed them. Right, and so this made us really think, what is the feasibility of coexistence for these animals? Not saying that we should be putting them back, but if it were to happen or to try and study the whole system, this whole socio-ecological system, what would we need to know to understand what leads to coexistence? And so I work with a group of historians and based on historical narratives, we would think that California grizzlies ate a lot of meat and were actively predating livestock also actively attacking people. And also in these historic documents, people are always referring to them as 2000 pounds, which is a very, very, very large bear that we don't have in North America today. So I've been uh, fortunate to be part of a collaboration between history and paleoecology, where my historian colleagues at UC Santa Barbara actually looked through all these old documents to try and figure out what was the diet and how big these animals were. And so based on all these historic observations, they were able to say, oh, they were eating you know, marine mammals or deer, they were seen uh, foraging for acorns. And then I was able to test these predictions using chemical and morphological techniques by using museum collections of these bears. So I went on a two year journey <laughs> of tracking down all of the California grizzlies across museum collections uh, in North America. And so not only was I able to have fossils or pre-European baselines, like these beautiful fossils from Rancho La Brea in Los Angeles, but also I was able to use post-European samples, like individuals that died after um, European arrival, including some of the very few pelts that are available for this species. And I used a technique known as stable isotope analysis. So for those of you who aren't familiar with it, I'm just gonna give you a very general idea where we use variation in carbon and nitrogen elements or signatures to determine an animal's diet. And so it can tell us if something's an herbivore, a carnivore, or a fish eater, because you effectively are what you eat. That signature gets incorporated into your tissues. And so normally we're gonna show you plots with an X and a Y axis with carbon on the X axis with variation linked to, for example, C3 and C4 plants, really the primary producers in an ecosystem and then on this y-axis, we have nitrogen or movement upwards on a food chain. So when we put these two things together, we can start to see where different organisms fall relative to each other within an ecosystem and also think about their diet. So we have our primary producers at the bottom, our herbivores in the middle, and our carnivores at the top. So when we do this for bears, not only did I have to go and find all of the bears, I had to find the historic food sources as well to match the time period that the bears lived and died in. So this required archeological samples and also required going to uh, botanic gardens, which I really loved. I had never had a chance to work with herbarium samples before. And so we were able to make a reference data set of different food items which you can see here for both pre and post-European values and then plot our grizzlies. So here for our pre-European populations, we see them in these triangles. And what's important to note is that when we add on the post-European bears, they shift upwards. So on this scale, on this y-axis, we see movement upwards indicating a shift in trophic position. So indicating they're moving higher up on the food chain. 
And then we used, if we think about it um, kind of as using fossils as a baseline, it allows us to see what exactly that shift was caused by. So here is just in pie chart form showing you um, some simplified outputs from a more complex model. But basically for our pre-European bears, their diet was approximately 80% plants and about 15% terrestrial protein like ungulates and the rest was probably some type of marine protein. When we compare that to our European bears, we see a very different diet. And we wouldn't know that this was a change if we didn't have that pre-European baseline. We didn't have that fossil baseline, which is really thanks to the contributions of paleontological and archeological museum collections. And so when we add in this post-European data, when we look at it here, we see that the bears are by and large still vegetarians, about 68% of their diet is plant. But now this meat consumption has doubled to about 30%. So again, still mostly plants, but it has changed. And not only has it changed in how much animal protein they're eating, we can specifically say because of the isotope signatures that it's likely that they may have been scavenging livestock carcasses brought by Europeans. And where did that 2000 come from is something that I really wanted to know uh, because it just seemed kind of out of the blue. And my colleagues, uh, have introduced me to going through old newspapers and looking at these reports. And when you read through these accounts, you can actually start to make a database of how big uh, people reported these bears being. So here it's, you know, 1,988 pounds. There are other quotes saying, oh, it'd weigh about 1,500 pounds. And so you can actually use these as a form of data. We can then compare those historic estimates to what we'd normally do as paleontologists, which is take isolated teeth or bits of skulls and reconstruct how big the body size should be based on known relationships between tooth size and overall body size. And so this is what I did because there's no living California grizzlies, we can't go put them on scale. I used measurements of teeth and skulls to estimate their overall body size. And so using things like skull length and molar size, I could develop an independent estimate of how big these bears would be and compare it to those newspaper articles. When we did that, uh, a very clear pattern emerged. So here's weight. When we use morphological estimates, uh, we get bears that are on average about 450 pounds versus those newspaper articles on average, the reported size is 900 pounds. So note that there's a wide error, including going up to that 2000, uh, 2000 pounds. And to me, this makes sense that people are probably reporting bears that either they're going after the really big ones, but also more likely they're just estimating ballpark huge bears because they would get more attention and more money for bringing in these bigger animals. But with these museum collections, we could actually revisit this narrative and say, well, you know, this wasn't the normal size of this bear. So in fact, California grizzlies were just the size of regular Yellowstone or Alaska grizzlies. So the conservation outcomes from using museum collections in this way is that we now know that California grizzlies were mostly herbivores. And this is important when thinking about where that species could realistically be put in the state today. They were not 2000 pounds. So people should not be thinking about 2000 pound bears roaming around their backyards. And I really like to think of how useful the fossil record was in this by showing us that there was a shift in diet and that it was due to human activity, because this is again, something that reminds us that we have the power for better or worse to alter the behaviors of wild animals. And I think of this as a could versus should question. As a scientist, I'm always working on the could side of the spectrum, um, but whether we should reintroduce a species or not, that's really up to stakeholders. Science is just one piece of that. So now I'll briefly tell you a fun story about rewilding, also with bears. So if you are in Southern California, you might see these little black bears hanging out in your backyard. Even though we don't have grizzly bears anymore, there are still black bears. And you might wonder where are these black bears coming from? It depends which discipline you ask. So if you ask a mammologist, they'll tell you that black bears were never present naturally in Southern California. So here before 13, uh, 1930 AD, if we look at data from museum skins and skulls in yellow, we can see here that they're all across the state, none in Southern California. And mammologists have said, oh, it's because they were outcompeted by grizzlies, so they weren't in that area. 
But working with historians tells you some really fun things, including that in 1933, it turns out black bears were released into the Angeles and San Bernardino National Forests in Southern California because apparently tourists really missed seeing bears after people went and killed the last grizzly bears. So they decided, okay, let's just take some of the problem bears from Yosemite and throw them over into Los Angeles. And you really actually see this on the maps. So if we take black bear occurrence post 1930 AD, both museum skins and skulls, but now also including iNaturalist citizen science or community science data, we see here that there's no bears before 1930, but they appear after 1930, right after they were introduced from Yosemite. And so one might argue, well, they're not native to Southern California. Does this mean we can manage them differently because they're causing problems in people's backyards? because they're not technically native. But then I was working at the tar pits at the time in Los Angeles, which is one of the best records of Pleistocene life in California and quite honestly, the world. And so my thought was, well, if black bears were not native to Southern California, I wouldn't find them at the tar pits, right? They wouldn't be in an ice age deposit of Southern California because they weren't there up until 1933. So of course I went and checked our collections and I found this drawer that said Ursus Americanus, which is the black bear. So this was intriguing. And after doing some morphological identification as well as radiocarbon dating the specimens, I was able to show that there are actually black bears present in Southern California uh, before or 28,000 years ago. So here we have this radiocarbon distribution at about 45,000 as well as several individuals um, pretty much about 30,000, 28,000 years old. So there were black bears in Southern California. We last see them about 28,000 years ago. And then something happens. They disappear and then show up again because of human influence, right? And so with paleontology, we can actually show at these museum collections that they were there in the Pleistocene. Something happened. And then we unintentionally reintroduced them or rewilded them, if you will, in 1933. And so that's the story of how we accidentally placed a scene rewilded Southern California. And apparently no one has really noticed yet. So with museum collections, we're able to tell this entirely new story that black bears are either native or not native, depending on which baseline of data you choose. And I think this is really interesting because whenever people would ask me about introducing grizzlies, it would seem like such a big deal. But now that I know this black bear story, it kind of changes my perspective on, well, we've done this before with one bear. What does that mean for doing it with another bear? And then lastly, I'll just end with some new research that I've started to give you a taste of thinking about this for another carnivore, coyotes, which are really expanding all across the US. So they're not just recovering in many places, some species are actually expanding their ranges. So unlike these bears in California, which appear to be, um, you know, in some cases a reintroduction, these coyotes are actually expanding into places they haven't lived before or would appear to not have lived before. And I think that museums have the ideal data sets to address these phenomena. So I've been working with a group of colleagues who are paleontologists as well as modern ecologists and wildlife managers to try and understand how we can use the history of species, even in places like cities, to recontextualize human wildlife conflict and to recontextualize this idea of species invading urban habitats. Can we tell the story in a different way that might facilitate coexistence? And so one of the things we've been working on is this paleobiology novel ecosystems approach where we assemble a transect through time, where we try to combine the fossil and archaeological record, in this case here we have coyotes from Rancho La Brea, so clearly they were in Los Angeles for 50,000 years at least. We then link that up with historical data as well as uh, data from historians like newspaper articles and connect that into the present day, really showing that these species have histories, they've been in these places, and I think that changes how people view their place in the urban ecosystem around them. So museum collections can really help us address many different dimensions of living with carnivores, with trying to reintroduce them and with helping people appreciate this idea of coexistence and 
this relationship that people have had with these species for better or worse for hundreds, if not thousands of years in some cases. And I am a huge fan of using place-based museum collections in this type of work. So again, like at the La Brea Tar Pits, our collections are from Los Angeles. And so people can come actually see the fossils coming out of their own backyard. And when you have these collections from a specific place, they allow people to really engage with questions of local concern. You can really dig in, <laughs> no pun intended, and see what this landscape looked like over time, what the species were doing, and have a new appreciation for biodiversity, even in places like cities. And I'm excited about this as places for building community and offering a space for dialogue. And I would encourage you that if you do international research, consider what this means, the idea of building place-based collections if you're trying to take specimens out of their country of origin, what those specimens might mean to that local community. Um, I think more and more, it's not just about the science, but also giving people the feeling of having access to their natural heritage. So with that, um, I just wanna note that without museums, we wouldn't have any samples of California grizzlies left without the foresight of people like Grinnell who wanted to collect species before they were disappearing. You know, I wouldn't been able to do this work. So I'm very thankful for all of the people who've worked in museums before me. Um, and I look forward to continuing to work in museums to do this research, but also to make them more accessible to both students from diverse backgrounds, but also the communities who live alongside these museums and who want to have access to pieces of their own history. So I have many, many people to thank, but I would love to take any and all of your questions. Awesome, thank you, Alexis, that was great. Um, so if you guys have questions, please use the Q&A box um, on the Zoom bar to submit those and we can kind of go over those. Um, I guess I want to start first and just ask you a quick question while people um, are asking theirs. Um, so it's often thought that museum collections are kind of in contradiction to modern conservation, modern conservation biology. How do you explain the utility of natural history collections to wildlife managers or the general public? Yeah, I will say that I, find a lot of use for these historic collections. I don't necessarily ethically agree with how they were collected at times, um, but I think given our crisis that we're in, we have to use everything we have access to and do it in a thoughtful and respectful way. So in one case, I actually use specimens from archeological sites. And part of that involves going through certain protocols to be respectful of the communities who are still there, whose you know, the specimens come from their land. Right, so recognizing where specimens come from and doing the work to engage with those communities, I think is incredibly important. For me personally, I think with museum collections, they provide excellent baselines for understanding and reframing conservation questions. That's how I use them. I'm not someone who goes out and does a lot of uh, lethal sampling. I use existing collections and combine that with other forms of data like citizen or community science. Um, or other samples that might be taking like working with hunters and trappers. So I think a lot of it also comes down to being creative. And part of that is actually really showing how useful the work of wildlife biologists is. Thank you. Um, we had a question here about stable isotope analysis specifically and said, uh, would you be able to detect if bears consumed humans with that analysis considering they're both omnivores? Oh, great question. So. Um, probably not because, um, A, we don't have humans in our data set, uh, but B, one of the things we're looking at are these general kind of ranges of uh, food items. So my guess is that a human would look a lot like something like a coyote or a bear itself, which is an omnivore. And so if a bear was actually eating a human, it would be higher on that food chain. So it would look even more carnivorous and wouldn't look like an omnivore. An omnivore but we can't really pinpoint exact species that they're eating unless there's a very distinct isotopic signature, which I don't think humans would necessarily have at that particular time, uh, given human diets. Um, and on a similar note with kind of the diets of these grizzly bears, um, so do you think the domestication of livestock drove shifts in the diets of grizzly bears? And then did you also see a shift in their tooth morphology as well? Uh, that is, 
certainly an interesting question with the teeth. I don't think we have a big enough sample size to ask that type of question because a lot of the bears were dealing with things that were either picked up off the ground after extinction or trophies that have deteriorated a lot. And so oftentimes you like you saw my sample sizes I have for the body sizes, they're maybe like 20. Um, so, and it's usually different teeth. So it can be a little difficult. Um, that said, I know other studies in places like Japan have actually detected changes in body size associated with diet shifts, associated with human activity. So whereas our bears in California may have become more carnivorous, bears in Japan actually became more herbivorous with human activity and they actually got, got smaller. Um, and then we have a question here from Pat. Um, when you present information or data regarding large con uh, carnivores that's contrary to commonly held beliefs, um, how receptive in your experience are public stakeholders of so hunters or farmers in revising their prior notions or beliefs? I think for those types of discussions, it's the science often needs to come second. So first I like to establish, you know, what are our shared values? I ask them and validate their um, you know, observations that they've seen outside. And I make it clear that you know, I'm not just someone who goes and spends all my time in the lab. I also work with wild animals. I get to hold these animals when I'm in the museum and experience them in the same way that those hunters and trappers do when they're going out and hunting. And so I really make it more about my personal experience um, and then I say, you know, I've also held these animals and I've also been able to take measurements in other ways. So yes, I bring the science in, but first it's a matter of finding ground and being respectful because a lot of things we know about carnivores, we do learn from those communities and their knowledge is incredibly important. Um, and then we also had a general question here about kind of methodology with isotope analyses and this person, they work on insects, but I guess it looks like their question is, you know, what, how much tissue do you need to be able to reconstruct these analyses to see what things are eating? A very small amount. Um, um, it depends on exactly what you're doing, but I would say like that much. <laughs> So not, not too much. So if you're working with insects, people certainly do these techniques with insect collections. Uh, it looks like we've got one final question here. Um, so a lot of your research relies on kind of historical context of individual museum specimens. Um, how important are paper records, field notes, or catalogs, and correspondence? Um, how important are those to your work and kind of how do you use those? Yeah, so I would say that for all of this work, I'm just one person on an interdisciplinary team. And so I personally don't work with the narratives, but I'll note when I was going and taking uh, like bone samples of grizzlies up in the Berkeley Museum, my colleague who is a historian, he was in the other side of the building going through all the old correspondences and uh, actually looking at where these bears came from. And we were able to avoid spending money sometimes on radiocarbon dating things by him actually going through these correspondences and saying, oh, this bear was sent in at this time. Um, you know, so we wouldn't have to try and radiocarbon date it to figure out when it died. Uh, or they might have notes on, oh, this bear was found in this grassy area and we could see if that agreed or disagreed with the isotopes. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so with that, uh, I will, uh, yeah, thank you for talking. That was a really great talk. Um, we'll be moving on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Daniel Park, um, and I'll give a quick introduction for him. Um, so Daniel Park's research focuses on eludicating biogeographic and evolutionary mechanisms of biodiversity patterns in the context of contemporary global environmental problems, notably biological invasions and climate change, within the aim of illuminating how these distributions affect multiple dimensions of plant diversity across rapidly changing landscapes. Drawing on these fields of biogeography, systematics, ecology, and evolution, and using big data, his work explores multiple facets of past, present, and future biodiversity to address the grand challenge of mitigating anthropogenic influences on world ecosystems. Dr. Park received his PhD from the University of California, Davis, and was recently an associate, a research associate at the Harvard uh, University Herbarium, and is now currently an assistant professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at Purdue University. 
All right. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the uh, wonderful introduction, Ben. Uh, it's a delight to be here. Um, and I will share my screen. All right, can everyone see my screen now? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, so hello everyone again, my name is Daniel Park and today I'm going to talk about uh, herbarium collections and how they kind of can be used to reveal a uh, wide variation in plant phenological responses to climate. Okay, uh, so first let's talk a little bit about plant phenology uh, in a changing world. So what is phenology exactly? It's the, um, it refers to the timing of life history events, uh, such as flowering or leaf out or leaf senescence or fruiting, uh, where, whoops, um, the, these, and in animals, it could be the timing of migration or hi hibernation or emergence. And the timing of these events are obviously very important uh, to an organism's survival and fitness. Uh, for instance, if a plant emerged and flowered or an animal came out in the middle of the winter, uh, they would have limited resources and be very uh, uh, limited in their chances of successful reproduction, uh, not to mention survival. However, plant phenology has been changing. The timing of various life history events has been changing uh, rapidly of late. Um, for instance, here's a picture of cherry blossoms blooming in Central Park in New York in the middle of January, or actually might be might have been early January uh, when these things are not supposed to happen. Cherry blossoms are generally uh, symbolic of spring, not winter, and this this particular cherry blossom and that bee for that matter is out of sync uh, in terms of time. And you've probably heard of similar examples where flowers seem to bloom or animals seem to emerge in weird times than not what's traditionally expected. So in accordance with global warming, uh, we've seen the trend where uh, phenology is changing a lot across many different systems. So in this meta, uh, Analysis Menzel et al. found uh, that a lot of plant species, wild and cultivated, uh, were advancing uh, their phenology, their flowering, their fruiting, uh, their leaf unfurling. Uh, in general, as you can see here, the majority of uh, case studies fall uh, under zero, meaning that their dates have, the occurrence dates of these events have advanced uh, over time. So what happens when phenology changes? So uh, first, uh, obviously there are phenological mismatches. Many uh, organisms have mutualistic or antagonistic uh, relationships with each other. And if their timing is no longer in sync, uh, you might find that plants and pollinators miss each other or plants and herbivores miss, 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 miss each other. Uh, second, uh, plant fitness itself um, and its survival and its reproductive success uh, can also decrease as the result of phenological change because it is no longer tracking uh, ideal environments or the ideal timing for these events to occur in. Finally, uh, as plants form the basis of most terrestrial ecosystems, changes in plant phenology can result in huge changes uh, across the ecosystem or even the globe. For instance, um, they can easily change carbon uh, dynamics and transforming an ecosystem from a sink to a source or a source to a sink. So phenology has large reaching uh, uh, consequences from local to global scales. However, uh, our knowledge of uh, plant phenology in particular is rather limited uh, in a few ways. First, if you look at the, the map here on top, you'll see that most of our phenological knowledge comes from temperate regions in the Northern Hemisphere, most notably uh, North America, Western Europe, and Northeast Asia. Second, uh, there are spatio-temporal gaps in the fact that a lot of these studies are either tend to be small scale observational studies uh, at the plot level or larger scale uh, studies using uh, satellite imagery. And hence you can see in panels B and C, that there are large gaps in terms of spatial grain, spatial extent, as well as temporal extent and temporal grain, because 
satellites pass uh, the same place uh, every week or every two weeks, and that results in the temporal grain of the study. Finally, uh, due to the nature of many of these studies, these uh, our phenological knowledge is focused on particular species and is not really wide ranging, especially not in terms of non-woody uh, species. And finally, there's a large tendency, a strong tendency for us to treat phenology as static uh, within a species. So within a species, all the individuals should be responding similarly to environmental forcings in terms of their timing. But that may not be the case, and but less is known about how much intraspecies variation exists. Now, along those lines, herbarium specimens, uh, pressed, dried collections of plants can present uh, a good resource to fill in some of these gaps in our knowledge and our sampling. Uh, first of all, herbarium specimens often capture phenological events. Um, these on the top row are pictures I've taken in the field out collecting. And on the bottom row, you can see that each one of these events that I observed were uh, historically uh, observed as well and preserved as herbarium specimens, whether it's leaf unfurling, uh, flowering, even uh, leaf uh, coloration and senescence and fruiting and the, whoops, uh, in this uh, uh, radish here. Further, herbarium specimens uh, have been collected all over the world, uh, so they offer a very spatially vast uh, resource from which we can draw, hopefully, phenological knowledge. And they also represent uh, the basis of our knowledge of plant diversity across the globe, meaning that if a plant is named, that there's a specimen of it somewhere that we can take a look at. Also, uh, herbarium specimens can uh, fill in temporal gaps that exist between observational studies. For instance, here, uh, these on the bottom row are observations made by Thoreau and others in more recent times of lady slipper orchids uh, in Concord, Massachusetts. And you can see that there's huge gaps, decades or hundreds of years of gaps in between some of these observations. However, if you look at herbarium specimens of the same species that were collected in the general area, they're more continuous and can fit in our knowledge of what was happening between say 1900 and 2000. Further, we've shown that, uh, it's been shown that phenological information that we get from herbarium specimens matches pretty well with uh, phenological information we can gather uh, from plot observations or field observations. Um, here you can see for those lady slipper orchids, uh, we've estimated the degree of phenological sensitivity to spring temperature, which means uh, infers to how much the timing of flowering in this case changes in response to a degree change in spring temperature. And the estimates you get from uh, specimens versus field observations are pretty uh, similar. So this tells us we can use herbarium specimens to infer uh, things about the temporal dynamics of plants However, uh, extracting phenological data from specimens is another matter because there are millions and millions of specimens out there, but we don't know which ones have flowers. We don't know which ones have fruit. We don't know which ones are in which uh, phenological stage of their lives. Uh, so extraction is a big task, but it has been facilitated with the onset and increase in uh, digitization. So one way we could extract phenological data from specimens is to train a computer to do the work. And uh, we've explored options uh, using machine learning to identify, say, flowers on a specimen and have the computer count them for us. Another way we can uh, extract phenological data from specimens uh, is to uh, ask for help from citizen science scientists and crowdsource uh, the tasks. So uh, the team at Harvard and the University of Waterloo uh, in Canada developed a uh, crowd curio, which is basically an image annotation platform that works with Amazon Mechanical Turk, where we present an image of a specimen and uh, citizen scientists can sign on and count them, count the buds, flowers and fruits or any other uh, features of interest. We present them with uh, example images, as you can see there. And when they feel like they've identified a flower or bud or fruit, they can go and click on it. 
And that saves the location of the organ as well as allows us to quantify the number of these organs and infer the phenological stage the specimen was in. When we looked at uh, how well uh, amateurs and citizen scientists performed in terms of counting these organs here uh, in the uh, right panel, you can see that uh, the counts from the experts and the citizen scientists lined up pretty well. Um, apolog I apologize for the small text, but the R values are all above 0.9 and they correlate pretty well. All right, so using this framework and the data I'm gonna talk about from this point are all gathered by these citizen scientists uh, can be used to explore variation in phenological responses to climate. So first we looked at a number of species across the Eastern United States, across different uh, ecological regions as defined as neon, or that can also be kind of broadly binned as uh, warm versus uh, uh, cold regions. Um, and these were specimens that were generally easy to identify and find uh, identify reproductive structures that had various reproductive timing and ranges spread wide across uh, the Eastern United States. Now, when we look at their phenological sensitivity, uh, which again is the amount uh, of change in the timing events in response to a unit change in an environmental forcing such as spring temperature here, we find that how the degree of response is very variable across species, right? We have a uh, species like number four here, Bidens, uh, that really don't respond too much in terms of their flowering time to changes in spring temperature, to things like anemones down here, which uh, shift their timing drastically uh, if the spring becomes warmer. Second, what we notice here is that species that tend to flower earlier in the year. So the x-axis here is uh, basically the mean time at when these uh, species flower. The earlier they flower, the more responsive they are to phenological, uh, to uh, spring temperature. In other words, early flowering species will shift their phenology more drastically uh, with uh, changes in spring temperature. However, what's interesting is you just saw a lot of variation in phenological sensitivity between species, but here as in the red box, we, we see as much, uh, if not slightly more variation within species across their ranges. This means that even within the same species, if you look at different populations, the uh, magnitude of their phenological responses to climate change can differ drastically. So how does this manifest across the landscape? Generally speaking, what we find is that species, well not species, individuals in warmer climates of the same species are more responsive to temperature than those in colder climates. So given the same amount of warming, Southern populations will shift their phenological timing to a greater degree than Northern populations of the same species will. As to why this might be so, we hypothesize this is because as you go down south uh, in the United, eastern United States, the climate becomes warmer, but it also becomes much more stable and predictable. Uh, thus, the risk of encountering unfavorable conditions is lower if you miss uh, time your, say, flowering or fruiting events. And water is also much less limiting uh, in these climates. Hence, plants can afford to be very fine-tuned to environmental cues, such as spring temperature. Whereas up in the north, uh, as the saying goes, if you don't like the weather in New England, you just wait five minutes. It's a highly temperamental climate and less predictable. Where And if plants are too fine-tuned to these uh, climatic cues, they might bloom one day after it's swarm and then get snowed on the next. All right, second, I'd like to talk about phenological displacement and flowering gaps. So another way intraspecific variation in uh, phenological responses can manifest is because of uh, phenological displacement, where basically uh, species exhibit different phenologies when in sympatry versus when they exist apart. For instance, on the left, you can imagine a case where species would flower further apart in time when they are in sympatry versus to when they do not occur together. And 
This could be due to, comp to reduce competition because they don't want to uh, draw from the same pollinator resources at the same time. Alternatively, you might find that uh, species flowering times could converge in sympatry when they're flowering to when they're occurring together due to some uh, potential facilitative interactions or environmental or evolutionary constraints, as in the window of opportunity being very constrained in that particular uh, sympatric environment. So uh, again, we used herbarium specimens a lot more this time, uh, about 40,000 or more, uh, to examine how this might, how sympatry among closely related species might affect phenological responses. So on average, we found that phenological displacement is not very common. So these are values that were plotted uh, and summarized by genus. So at the genus level, we only find one or two genera where uh, plants, the congeners tend to flower at dif differently when they're in sympatry versus when they're in allopatry. And in all the other cases, uh, as you can see in this kind of density plot here, when we model the phenology of species taking into account um, co-occurrence, which is the darker color versus when we model the phenology of species without taking into account co-occurrence, the results are largely the same across uh, these 110 species that we looked at. However, displacement is generally rare across uh, these genera that we looked at, but when you look at uh, it at the scale of individual species pairs, we do see some patterns. Most notably, we see that on average, species that exhibited phenological uh, displacement or in terms of convergence or divergence, uh, were they had the displacement was stronger in things that flower closer together in time. So on average, we found that uh, for species that exhibited convergence, they would flower about four or five days uh, closer to, uh, together when they were co-occurring uh, as opposed to when they were occurring totally apart in different places. Uh, in this graph here, uh, um, a negative value indicates that things are converging in, uh, in uh, sympatry, whereas a positive value indicates that things are diverging in sympatry. So how would this uh, manifest with climate change? The problem here uh, is that with changing climates, a lot of these species are going to respond uh, in very different ways and sometimes in different ways across their ranges. So overall, we find that with global warming, uh, the gap between cl uh, close, the flowering gap between closely related species is going to increase in general. So congeneric species are going to flower further apart uh, in their ranges. This could be a problem, especially for species in this lower right panel that have exhibited some degree of convergence in sympatry in terms of flowering time, which means there might be a reason that they tend to flower a little closer together when they occur together. And if they drift apart, uh, this could mean uh, uh, pa patterns of gene flow, interactions with mutualists or interactions with the abiotic environment could change as well for the worse. All right, finally, I'll talk to you very briefly about the perils and pitfalls of using uh, these kinds of collection data. So first of all, herbarium collections and animal collections for that matter, were you generally not meant uh, for ecological research in many cases, and thus they have intrinsic biases in multiple dimensions. For instance, the most obvious one is that here, there's several areas of the globe that are better collected than others. Uh, for instance, uh, North America, whereas we have very few specimens uh, collected from large swaths of the rest of the world. And even in well collected uh, areas, such as Australia, uh, South Africa, and New England, we find that collections tend to be biased as well. Uh, here, you can see that there are distinct areas that are in warmer colors that are tend to be have many, many specimens collected from, whereas you have a large swath of blue or cooler areas where there are not a lot of specimens uh, collected. And a lot in many of these cases, uh, you may notice that these concentrations of collections correspond with roads, uh, population centers, and herbaria. 
So herbarium collections can also be temporally biased. Um, these are histograms of collections through time in New England, South Africa, and Australia. And you can see that they're all, they all look slightly different. For instance, in New England, collection activity peaks in the early 1900s uh, and just drops off uh, after that. Whereas in South Africa and Australia, herbaria there have access to, have collected a lot more specimens recently. So if you looked at the record of plants in New England, you'd be biased towards the early 1900s. Whereas if you're looking in Australia, they would actually be towards the late 21st century. And although this is not likely to affect science, you also notice that uh, in New England, people tend to collect more during the weekends as well. Specimen collections are also uneven across taxa and lineages, meaning that certain species and certain lineages are much better sampled and much better represented in our herbarium collections than others. So here, uh, the blue branches indicate branches that have been well collected and the red branches indicate branches uh, as taxa and lineages that have been less collected. And you can see that there are several lineages here that are under, under samples, whereas there are lineages here that are oversampled or collected very well. And finally, uh, specimen metadata are very limited. So in the case of this uh, specimen of trillium, if we look at the label, um, and if you can decipher the handwriting, we can determine that it was collected in June 19, 1833 or 55, I'm not so sure here, uh, in Cumberland. However, when you, so first of all, it's missing an exact date and it's also missing an exact place, but this is all the data that's associated with the specimen. However, when you look this up on a database, uh, you'll notice that there are a set of very accurate coordinates here uh, where that information does not exist on the label. So how did that happen? So on the left, uh, this is an advertisement for the Magellan NAV 1000, which is the world's first commercial handheld GPS receiver. And it came out in 1989 for about $3,000, I think. Uh, so the specimen we previously saw was collected in 1855 or 33. So co coordinate, accurate coordinates should not be associated with that specimen, but it is. And in this case, it's likely the case that uh, the coordinates correspond right here to the center of Cumberland in Maine and was associated with it by the person who did the database entry. And we call this georeferencing or geolocation. Um, this is troubling because this means that in effect, anything collected before the 90s probably has coordinates that are inaccurate to varying degrees. And these centroid coordinates are not always representative of the local environment, which makes it dangerous for you to associate, want to associate them with environmental conditions or other things, other purposes beyond just assigning a general location to uh, the specimen collection. For instance, this is a plot of ordination uh, climate uh, of Montrose County in Colorado. All these green points indicate points in the county. And this little uh, red star here indicates uh, the geographic centroid of that county. And in climate space, you can see it's almost an outlier. Thus, before using any sort of biological collection data for purposes outside, uh, which they were originally collected for, for instance, uh, taxonomy and systematics, we need to clean and standardize the data. Uh, for instance, there's a dozen ways to, to spell the United States uh, and taxonomy varies over time, over institution, over uh, expert opinion. So leading to a variety of names for the same taxon. So we need a workflow like this example here, which is what we use at BN, the Botanical Information and Ecology Network, to clean uh, collection metadata, where you standardize taxonomic ranks and names, you standardize geographic names, and you verify uh, that these taxa are placed in the correct places. Finally, we still have a really long way to go because uh, when we did a quick survey of a major area across the globe, we found that on average, less than 30% of the specimens they have stored in their institutions have metadata available online. And less than 10% of those specimens have images online. Thus, whatever insights we gain from these types of studies using digitized specimens, must we need to temper them 
uh, by the fact that they, these results are gleaned from a very small subset of specimens in most cases. Nonetheless, I'd like to make the point that the digitization of specimens and the subsequent creation of digital-only workflows or digitization 2.0 has facilitated a wide range of traditional and new collections-based research. And I'd argue it's become even more important uh, in the era of COVID-19 where field work and travel to herbaria and museums has been become increasingly difficult. Okay, with that, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators. Uh, all the work here presented was a collaborated, collaborative effort and would not have been possible without uh, these wonderful people, uh, as well as the herbaria, the collectors, the curators and citizen scientists across the world that have helped us make this uh, research possible. And of course, thank you uh, for listening and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Daniel, that was a great talk. Um, uh, yeah, we can start off with the first question here from Richard. Um, and he was asking if, if you, uh, with your work, do you take into account any differences between species that were native first introduced? Right, so the sampling for uh, all the studies that I talked about today include both native and non-native species. Uh, we, there were way, way more native, so we didn't really have the power to test whether there was a significant difference between native and non-native species in terms of their phenological responses. Um, but there have been other studies out there that show often invasive species at least can be phenologically more responsive uh, to climate and that gives them an edge uh, uh, in, comp in temporal, the temporal competition for resources uh, with natives. And also there's been some studies, uh, I think for Richard Premax lab in Boston University that found that uh, the fruits of invasive species tend to stick around longer uh, during the season, offering a food source for birds and other small animals uh, well into winter and facilitating their dispersal, of course. Awesome. Um, and then we have another question. Um, so someone who also works with herbarium specimens. Um, so in their use of herbarium specimens and historical DNA of cryptic species, have you found any certain colored flowers uh, or have you found certain colored flowers are extremely biased? That was from Dr. Boutain. Um, see. Um, I'm not quite sure what the question is. Uh, are you asking whether uh, people tend to collect certain colored flowers more? Uh, I guess they can also leave a comment to see if that's correct, but it looks like, yeah, in my use of herbarium specimens and historical DNA of cryptic species, we found, um, yeah, for example, green flowers are biased. Yes, okay, uh, yes. Um, so we didn't look at uh, uh, flower color as a, as a variable in this case, but we do see that uh, there are several things that tend to be better collected, probably most likely because they are attractive. They have large, colorful, uh, floral displays, which makes them noticeable, easier to identify, and just generally pretty and beautiful, and we're drawn to beautiful aesthetics. Uh, however, that doesn't mean that things with uh, smaller, less attractive flowers are less collected. Uh, for instance, we have at, at many herbaria, ferns are very well collected that don't have flowers at all. And uh, some of the best collected species are actually grass species, which we didn't use here because the uh, reproductive uh, organs are pretty small and hard to detect uh, and discern for citizen scientists. So I would say, yes, there is some bias uh, uh, towards collecting things with colorful, large floral displays, but it's not the only thing that determines the amount of collections. There's plenty of things like grass species that don't have those nice colorful flowers, but are really, really well represented. And another answer to that is, uh, I, I didn't show it here, but herbarium collections are very much often biased by a handful of mega collectors who have collected thousands or tens of thousands of specimens during their career. So their interests can largely shape uh, how the collections are sampled. So if you had a grass expert in your herbarium who was a prolific collector, you'll have a lot of grass species and specimens. Awesome, thank you. And then we'll, uh... One final question to ask you before we move into the next talk. Um, so do you think that climate change driven changes in flowering phenology may ever reduce gene flow between different populations um, contributing to fragmentation? Yes, uh, uh, there are 
um, we found that uh, these are very broad geographical patterns, but in general, uh, with warming, we're going to see closely related species drift apart uh, in terms of uh, flowering time. And I'd expect to see the same thing in uh, populations of the same species if climate change is uniform. However, uh, so uh, it, it depends on the system. In some systems, we do see that. Uh, climate change is mostly uniform and populations tend to drift apart. But in the case of, and we saw that in a, actually a recent study uh, uh, on the West Coast in California, but on the East Coast, it's a little, gets a little more complicated because the Northeast has uh, and continues to experience higher degrees of warming than the Southeast does. Whereas the Southeast populations tend to be a bit more sensitive to climate. So how that will play out remains to be seen because climate change doesn't occur equally across the landscape, but it's definitely a possibility. Awesome, thank you so much. All right, and now we are on to our final speaker today, uh, Dr. Alex White. Um, Alex studies how ecological interactions between species underlie for uh, broad patterns of biodiversity, such as the latitude or latitudinal diversity gradient. He uses morphological and computational approaches to understand how traits mediate the spatial interactions between close related species and how those dynamics are influenced by historical and contemporary abiotic conditions. His research integrates diverse sources of data, such as field studies, museum collections, phylogenies, and climate models, with a focus on computational methods and machine learning. He received his PhD from the University of Chicago, where he studied the ecological and evolutionary dynamics of a community assemblage or community assembly in Himalayan birds. And currently, he works as a postdoc at the Smithsonian Data Science Lab in the Department of Botany at the National Museum of Natural History. All right, with that, yeah, take it away, Alex. Okay, great. Um, can everyone see the screen? Looks good. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks again, Ben, for the uh, introduction, and thank you to the um, the symposium organizers for the invitation to take part. I think Dan's talk, uh, Daniel's talk, really, uh, I think, dovetails very well with the things that I'm going to speak about today. Um, again, I'm Alex White. I work in a group at the Smithsonian called the Data Science Lab um, and also in, uh, uh, in the Department of Botany at the National Museum of Natural History, all both parts of the Smithsonian. Um, but I am a biologist and I'm, I'm really, as uh, Ben pointed out, interested in these um, really pervasive patterns that we see across the tree of life. And one of the most, one second. One of the most common patterns is the number of species uh, being found to be much greater in the tropical latitudes than elsewhere on Earth. And like I said, this is a, a pattern that we see over and over again um, in both the marine and terrestrial realm, and it's particularly true for plants. So uh, here I'm just showing the number of uh, flowering tree species in the Americas, and we can see that there are many more species in the, uh, at the equator than there are found elsewhere. Now explanations, there are many, many uh, studies that have attempted to explain the differences in species numbers across the globe, but most of these I'm going to kind of venture out here and say that most of these studies kind of fall into one of three categories. The explanation uh, could be that there are just differences in diversification rate between tropical and temperate areas so that there are just more species being generated per unit time, which is why we find more species in the tropics. The second is that independent of any sort of difference in diversification, the tropics may just be older and larger so that even if diversification rates were the same, we just find more species in the tropics because they've existed for longer in terms of those climates and habitats. And the third is the explanation that I'm focused on uh, in the study that I'm gonna talk about today. And that's that, that there are different differences in the ecological dynamics between the tropics and temperate, such that more species can be accommodated in the tropics. So let's dig a little bit deeper and uh, kind of tell you um, some more detail about what I mean. Here, just take a hypothetical distribution of three species and their trait values and the frequency of their traits underneath some uh, hypothetical limit here, which is indicated in the white curve. If we were to add a species to this, uh, to this location, 
we would expect that the trait distributions for the three other species would narrow or would need to be narrower in order to accommodate the fourth species that I've just added on the left. So um, this kind of dynamic indicates that uh, tropical or it suggests uh, the question of whether tropical tree species are more densely packed in trait space. So um, that is, is really the hypothesis that we're attempting to um, evaluate in this study. One of the reasons that we're so interested in um, traits as opposed to the number of species in a given location is that species that are similar in shape and size are kind of assumed to be performing some sort of similar ecological function. So that kind of indicates that species richness is not so much uh, is not equivalent in any way to functional richness. And one of my favorite examples is from a genus of birds, the white eyes. Um, here, this genus is uh, Zosterops. I'm just showing you six museum specimens, each representing a different species of Zosterops. And you can see, um, you know, if we were to count the number of species in this region, we would count six, but we might be, um, you know, counting many, uh, a much lower richness in terms of function, just based on how similar these species are. So that brings us to the two basic questions that I'm pursuing here. The first is how does morphological diversity vary according to latitude? We know that the numbers of species varies, but um, there's uh, an outstanding question about how shape follows this uh, phallus pattern as well. And the second is, do species then at different latitudes subdivide the ecological opportunity differently? And as I said at the beginning in the title of my talk, um, I'm, I'm interested in data science methods that can help us answer these questions, in particular because, as Dan pointed out, Daniel, the rise of uh, digitized museum collections really helping us uh, potentially use computer vision or uh, also known as deep learning in this case um, to study these two questions. So for uh, the next part of the talk, I'm actually going to dive deep, uh, hopefully, you know, with some energy to keep everyone awake at 2 p.m. Uh, on an afternoon uh, that looks very beautiful outside. Um, uh, so I'm going to dive deep in some of the methods here and then also talk about these uh, two questions in particular in the context of the study that I'm doing here, which is on ferns. So the focus of this study is on the diversity of the shapes of fern leaves. And here I'm just showing nine examples of herbarium specimens of different species of ferns in as kind of to represent a wide diversity of the, the shapes that you can see. There's about uh, 13,000 or so species of ferns distributed on the globe. Those ferns, uh, ferns do show a characteristic latitudinal gradient. Here, I've just mapped the uh, available um, preserved specimen records for uh, ferns in the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. So the number of species in every one degree bin uh, or map cell is on the map and the, um, the figure is just showing the count of those uh, species numbers. And we can see, of course, that there are many more in the tropics than outside. Ferns, as Daniel pointed out, are extremely well represented, not only in collections, also in digitized collections, particularly so in the National Museum of Natural History at the Smithsonian, where all of the fern specimens have so far been digitized. There are about 200,000 ferns uh, specimens that have been digitized that we make use of in this study. We also add to that Smithsonian collection all of the available images that have been uh, uh, deposited in the integrated digitized bio collections. So that makes uh, about 513,000 specimens that have been included in this study. Uh, the, the number of species and genera uh, also so um, gets close to at least two thirds of the species that are uh, in, in the globe for ferns and about 90% of the generic diversity. So I said that what we were interested in was using deep learning or computer vision to assess this kind of trait um, distribution or the trait density of ferns across the globe. And the way that we intended to do that was actually build convolutional neural networks, which is a deep learning tool, um, and train those 
to label the fern specimen with the correct taxonomic ID. So here I'm showing a schematic of what a convolutional neural network basically does with the data that it takes in. On the left is the image. That image and the pixels that are in that image are then compressed down um, into a kind of small uh, a subset of information that's then used to generate a species identification, or in this case, a taxonomic identification. Um, we use about 2,000 species uh, for this part of the model because those are the species where we have many uh, examples, so multiple specimens uh, across a given threshold. Using uh, uh, this model to uh, identify the genus of ferns, we uh, can build an incredibly accurate model. Um, and we can represent basically the, the accuracy of our model using this type of figure here, which is called a confusion matrix. There's about 100,000 images that we didn't use uh, to train our model at all. So we set those aside, and those all have some known taxonomic identity. We can then pass those through our trained model and the model will make a prediction. On each row here is represents a single genus in our data set. And what you're looking for is that the percentage of predictions overlaps with the actual genus uh, at a high percentage of times. So what you wanna see is a purple diagonal along the, um, this matrix, which uh, we are generally close to. The three boxes there represent different families of ferns. And you can see the off diagonal elements actually show that the errors where the predicted and the actual genus don't, over, uh, don't match up, those errors in, in at least these three examples show that errors are happening um, between genera within the same family. So there's a biological intuition for how a neural network is making this type of, of identification. So very encouraging, uh, high identification accuracy. Deep neural networks uh, are capable of kind of doing this uh, kind of uh, highly resolved uh, identification, but they really are notoriously uninterpretable, um, which, which is something that uh, in particular kind of made us concerned about how this uh, kind of high accuracy was being produced. And one uh, big problem here is that each of these images really contains a lot of other information that isn't necessarily specifically related to what the fern looks like. And that includes the taxonomic label itself, um, institutional markers, and all sorts of other potential uh, indicators that a neural network is going to use if available to it to make a proper identification. So if you could uh, uh, you know, imagine species that are only contained in given collections, then potentially the, those are being identified using particular uh, markers. But uh, we set out to kind of change that um, using another type of neural network approach, which is called segmentation. Uh, in this case, we had to build uh, what you see or uh, kind of generate what you see in column B, which is the um, which is a, a ground truth mask of which pixels in the uh, image in panel A are actually plant pixels and which of the other pixels in this image uh, are something else. So generating that by hand for about 400 specimens uh, with undergraduates at Brigham Young University, uh, McKinnon Baugh and Abigail Jenkins did this work. And we were able to train then a neural network to generate those masks automatically. So we did about 400 ground truth masks, which required a lot of intensive effort. But then we were able to apply that model or that uh, deep learning segmentation model to all of the 500,000 images that were in our data set so that we could uh, basically uh, be looking at images which looked like those two on the right hand side of the screen. So instead of the image uh, that I originally showed you, when masked, it would look something like this. All of that other information disappeared. And again, we're passing it through the, this neural network to generate this species identification. At uh, the species level, the model is really in, uh, incredibly accurate. Um, so much so that uh, I'm you know, beginning to wonder whether or not there really is the kind of upper limit. Um, 
the species accuracy in the top five is 95.6 percent and that means for the five species with the greatest probabilities we tend uh 95 percent of the time to have the exact match uh for the original species label in the model um and the upper limit basically i'm just trying to say that uh you know there's a lot of information that's used to delimit species that it really is not present in these images and so uh you know the exact match accuracy could potentially top out for any kind of closely related group like this, um, just based on the fact that species are, are divided into uh, categories based on traits that aren't present in the image. Um, but we are really interested actually in shape. We're not <laughs> so much, uh, I mean, it is really uh, kind of uh, impressive to see such a, a accurate classification model, but it's because this classification task forces a neural network to learn so much about the diversity of fern shapes that we took this approach. So all of the, um, everything that happens in the first part of this neural network is really about compressing the information of what shapes are present in this image that are useful for the task in the last layer, which is the classification layer. And it's this, shape information that we're really after, which means we can extract that information from a vector that is generated per image and the final part of the neural network. But this is a huge vector. It is uh, 2000 in length. That's kind of an arbitrary size. Um, it has nothing to do with ferns. It has to do with the architecture that was used to generate the model, um, which is more about deep learning science than it is about biology. Um, but some uh, co some authors have really kind of uh, been digging in to try to understand the intrinsic dimensionality of these deep learning data sets. Um, so in this case, what is a 2000 in length vector of shape information may have some so, some much lower dimensionality. And the intuition there is, is for probably other people in this uh, in the audience who might be more familiar with something like principal components analysis, where we, if we had many, many dimensions of, in, of uh, data, we could use principal components to reduce that data to the, the, the small number that would be most useful for representing the, the variation in our data. Um, some other uh, deep learning scientists have studied this across many uh, neural networks. So all of the different curves here just represent some other type of neural network architecture. And they've shown that the intrinsic dimensionality in this case, this is kind of equivalent to the number of important components and principal components um, is very small, even though these layers tend to be very large. So um, we could apply then uh, kind of reasonably some low dimensional type of analysis to our own data set and take some confidence that that is representative of the total uh, diversity or variation uh, contained in our data. So if we use the same method to estimate our own data set, uh, we get down to about eight uh, intrinsic dimensions in these, uh, from this shape layer of our model. Which was uh, which gives us some hope to actually use eight dimensions to do the type of analysis that we're interested in in trait space instead of a kind of enormously cumbersome data set like 2048, where there's an, a, a lot of collinearity, which is basically the, the issue. So uh, from this point forward, I'm going to show you a lot of really low dimensional projections of these shape vectors. Um, and really the means of these uh, four species of ferns. Um, so uh, when using this data and projecting them in low dimensions, we can look at the relationships between fern species. In this case, each point in this plot, which is just two dimensions uh, of a low dimensional data set from this deep learning network. It, these are, each point is the representative of the species means for all of the 8,000 species that we had available to us. And each point then, uh, or, and the density of points really is then a, the density of the species in some morphospace. Here, I'm just showing you that there are, you know, unique parts of this morphospace, which look very different from each other in terms of what the plants look like that are embedded in them. Um, but instead of just, you know, showing 8,000 different images, what I did was I, I carved this into tiles 
And um, we can then look at an image that is representative of basically the centroid of that tile. And I'm going to blow that up so we can take a closer look at the, the shape-based information that's learned from making species identifications in this model. So I've divided the, um, these tiles into four quadrants. And you can basically use a qualitative assessment to see that there are some uh, kind of reasonable um, uh, ways in which the species are varying across this space. The first axis seems to be something to do with the division, number of divisions in the leaves. So more divided leaves on the right and less divided on the left. And the second axis seems to have something to do with the size of the, um, of the plant on the herbarium sheet. So that means that these four quadrants can really uh, kind of represent large divided things, uh, divided small things, and so forth. Um, but we can dig deeper and, of course, apply uh, our, the geographic information that we have to assess um, what this looks like. Um, but before we do that, I just want to kind of zoom in a, a little bit further and just overlap that species density plot again with this shape-based projection. And we can see that there are at least two regions which are incredibly specious and also um, representative of huge uh, uh, families and genera that I think are worth pointing out. Uh, so this less divided, smaller region of morphospace, uh, this one genus, Elaphoglossum, is almost entirely contained within this one uh, square, this red square at the bottom left. Um, and there's about 1,700 species embedded in that part of morphospace. Uh, the, the, uh, the blue square all is also contains most of the, the species in a family of tree ferns called the Cyathiaceae, which has about 728 species. Um, so it's this shape uh, kind of morphospace that we're using then to uh, move forward to look at the geographic relationships between species. Uh, and their traits. So uh, the main thrust of this talk at the beginning was the disparity in, in traits uh, across latitudes and how does that conform to our understanding of the number of species. Here I've again plotted the number of species in our uh, photo data set. Um, and here I'm just showing that there are more densely packed uh, in this kind of low dimensional space, um, species are more densely packed together in the tropics than they are elsewhere. And I'm measuring that using the neighbor distance. So what is the nearest neighbor uh, among species and just taking the median here. So there, this is each point on this plot is representing the, uh, a distribution essentially. And we can see that things become closer together, uh, that distance is shorter in the tropics. But what kind of intrigued me more was that the really big significant differences are uh, in these distributions are happening across the tropical temperate boundary. So there's a large shift in the way that um, species are um, related to one another in this morphospace uh, across the temp tropical boundary, which kind of indicates maybe that there are different regimes of density which conform to uh, a basic uh, kind of uh, partition of the globe into regions that are temperate, regions that are uh, highly uh, varying in terms of uh, becoming more tropical, and those regions that are tropical. And that uh, tropical density is really kind of somewhat um, consistent, even, uh, even though the number of species is changing rapidly, even within that uh, part of, of the world um, between those different latitudinal bands. Uh, I just wanted to, you know, point out that, that, you know, ferns have many different growth habits. And one of the things that we think is playing a big role for the tropics is that um, essentially almost all epiphytic ferns are only distributed, um, save a small number of species in tropical latitudes. And those ferns really look a lot like the Elaphoglossum species that I showed you uh, in, the, in the previous slide. They're, they're kind of simple uh, or they're less divided. They have uh, you know, strap-like leaves. And so we think 
epiphytism plays a big role. So do species at different latitudes subdivide ecological opportunity differently? I think we found some evidence for that just using this uh, innovative uh, approach with deep learning. I mean, deep learning is, is just something that um, hasn't really been explored uh, incredibly uh, deeply in, in its applications to these questions that have been ongoing. And I think we at least have one, some indication that it's pretty useful in this case. Uh, like I said, though, of course, the other question is, is uh, how then does the shape diversity vary according to these uh, different latitudinal uh, bins? Um, I'm showing you how the density varies, but uh, let's take a closer look um, at the variation uh, or just the total diversity of morphology that's contained across latitudes. So here is a representation of the same kind of two dimensional or very low dimensional space that I showed you uh, a number of times. But here I've carved it up, uh, showing you just three, um, three different latitudinal bins containing all of the species that are present in uh, our data uh, in those bins. And so we can see that the morphological uh, landscape is, changes quite a bit when you move from the tropics to higher latitudes. But if we use hypervolumes to assess the size of, these, uh, of this morphological Logical space, we can see that there are indeed large um, hypervolumes at the tropics. Um, so, in this, and these are using eight dimensional hypervolumes using those intrinsic dimensions that we were interested in. But um, if you compress this data set even further, so this would be basically saying we're going to take the most coarse view of what our data look like in very low dimensions the size of the morphological uh, space that is occupied is actually greater in the temperate, uh, north temperate than it is outside of that. And this is a result that we're um, extremely surprised by and very curious to uh, understand more, uh, more deeply. Um, as, as far as biological explanations are concerned, one uh, potential uh, explanation is that there's just an overlap between temperate like things, which are unique to the North temperate and uh, species from the tropics. And that kind of combination of different clades is actually what is driving this result. And then again, that's you know, to be, to be uh, qualified to say that this is really in a very low dimensional coarse morpho space, which, which is actually three dimensions. So how does morphological shape diversity vary according to latitude? Uh, at least in extremely low dimensions, this uh, very intriguing result is, uh, you know, giving us some uh, more food for thought in terms of how, um, basically, how this deep learning-based approach is uh, could potentially reveal something that is very counter to the intuition that that um, the number of species would be much more important in terms of of driving the kind of total shape diversity than would be indicated by this slide. So uh, just to wrap up, uh, deep learning, as I said, and I've mentioned, it's really an unexplored tool. Um, Daniel uh, spoke briefly uh, and gave some, some great overview about um, how machine learning and deep learning are incredibly useful for many, many different types of questions uh, in collections in particular. And, um, I think that just by even trying to apply a similar framework of what I've uh, shown here, there are so many other questions about what specimens and species um, look like that are really deep learning is the kind of tool that I think will be so useful in terms of kind of un unpacking the incredible complex diversity of the way things uh, appear. Um, and so uh, I don't think that deep learning will be an inscrutable tool for much longer. It has been uh, kind of mythologized as something that is black box, needs enormous amounts of data. Um, but I, I, any assessment that I've made in the last six months is that um, things are changing so rapidly on that front. We can look forward to a lot of applications of deep learning where we have a lot more insight into what exactly is happening inside these neural networks. So with that, um, there are many people to thank, um, in particular, my co-authors, 
And uh, a colleague of mine who really helped out a lot with a lot of the um, data acquisition for the geographic information, that's Joel Mita. Um, and uh, many thanks to the University of Michigan uh, for the invitation. And also I was in fact a student at the University of Michigan as an undergraduate. So um, thank you to them for inspiring me to kind of take on this, this career as a scientist. And thank you so much to everyone for, uh, for watching. Oh, thank you for the really interesting talks, Alex. Uh, and you know, glad to have you back for this. <laughs> um, I guess I'll start off with people, if you want to put questions that talk for Alex, uh, I have specifically, so I work with um, fish CT scans, so, you know, 3D vertebrate morphology. Is there, do you see any application of this being translated into more three-dimensional shapes um, going forward, since there's two-dimensionality to them? Absolutely. So, um, you know, the kind of off-the-shelf computer vision methods uh, commonly um, are using two-dimensional imagery, um, but that doesn't mean that um, there aren't a lot of people trying to innovate, especially in the medical space, uh, for um, taking in three-dimensional images. And uh, there has been actually some really exciting recent advances in using kind of three-dimensional microscopy techniques for um, applying deep neural nets to um, questions about taxonomy and biodiversity, and that's particularly in pollen. Um, so uh, there have already been some exciting advances using three-dimensional data. And uh, the cool thing also really is that uh, the number of dimensions, um, I mean, right now I've shown you a lot about computer vision, which is, uh, which is image-based. But there are also applications in deep learning to a lot of the tabular data that we have um, collected in natural history museums. And so there's really the data themselves uh, can be, I think um, you can think of applications in many different frames and not just in kind of the, the, the image space. Awesome, thank you. Uh, and someone had a question uh, about how your model performed um, with ferns on simpler leaves. Um, so did ferns with, you know, simpler leaves perform better in this model or did more complex friends, you know, kind of mess with the model in this case? That's a really good question. Um, I don't have a specific answer. And so that uh, of course is making me feel like I really need to know <laughs> what that, uh, how it performs in that case. Um, so I suppose I don't necessarily have an answer, though I would say that one thing that was at least indicated by the morphospace is that it embedded many, many of those Alaphagolossum species, which are incredibly simple looking, um, into a very dense part of morphospace. And that uh, kind of the, the density itself is also somewhat of an indication of, of its inability basically to separate those species in, a, in its kind of network. So. Um, I would assume that the simplicity would actually make it more challenging because um, of how incredibly similar a lot of those species look. Awesome. And I actually have a few questions here about, the, um, I think, relating to that kind of big quadrant you put up with all the different mm -hmm. types of ferns in those two axes. Mm -hmm. um, so with those kind of broad patterns, did you try to account for phylogeny in this case, or are we seeing this, you know, as this convergence in this case? Um, um, so the question is, is the phylogenetic um, diversity of the species that are embedded in this model similar to um, the morphological diversity or do they follow similar? Yeah, patterns? so like, we're, like, so like, yeah, was there any like phylogenetic um, analysis done that to like remove phylogenetic influence from where those are positioned or? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's, uh, so I guess it depends on exactly how you want to answer this question uh, in terms of why phylogeny should be removed or not. I think, um, you know, the way I would approach it is uh, phylogeny probably plays a very important role. Um, and there are some examples where phylogenetic uh, relationships are very close uh, in morphospace and other examples where they're not. Um, because essentially we're looking at shape diversity, I don't think it's, I mean, I never felt compelled to say remove the influence of phylogeny, um, but, uh, you know, you, we, um, I mentioned Joel Nita and he's actually worked very hard to develop a phylogeny, which we're also integrating into this study. Um, and essentially, um, well, an exciting result that's also been shown from some other studies is that 
closely related things, um, the accuracy of a model tends to kind of also follow these phylogenetic uh, relationships. So like I showed you at the beginning, the genera that fall within families, those tend to be often confused with one another, which kind of indicates that they're um, similar in shape. Um, so yeah, I think the future of, of this study and any other study that intends to kind of take this on is really kind of to integrate a phylogenetic perspective as well. Awesome, and we'll, I'll ask one more question here before I move on to the um, kind of more panel discussion portion here at the very end. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, so um, do you have a sense or intuition on how this shape data would look across time? So if you were to incorporate some paleo uh, botanical collections and ferns? Uh, that is really, uh, I don't have a sense um, because I, I, don't, I don't know what the paleo data would look like. Um, I think it's a great question, and um, you know the the most important component of that would be to identify a method where we could represent fossil ferns and these uh, herbarium images kind of in a similar data context. Um, so when I mentioned the pollen study, one really exciting thing about that was that they used a uh, modern uh, kind of microscopy method to represent modern pollen and fossil pollen in the same uh, type of data. And so if we were kind of looking at paleo data, um, you know, which I'm sure that there will be many people who are interested in that, um, it's going to be exciting to kind of project those paleo fern shapes into a kind of modern uh, fern morpho space that I've generated. Awesome, yeah, thank you. And thank you to all of, um our participants who submitted questions, things like that. Um, but now we're going to be kind of shifting over to the more panel side of, of our discussion here, kind of focusing more on museum collections and whole and early career topics as well. So if people have questions related to that, for either Alex or Daniel in this case, um, we can start fielding those. Um, I figured I'd start us off here um, with a question for the both of you um, <clears throat> on the early career side. Um, so I guess, let's see. Uh, how do you envision your program engaging, or I guess your research program engage, or going forward, engaging collections? Um, and how do you envision training students in this kind of work, whatever you do with collections? Either you or Daniel can answer this as well. Okay, I guess I'll uh, go ahead. Um, I mean, one really, as Daniel pointed out as well, one um, you know benefit of all being forced to kind of virtually work is, um, <clears throat> kind of being forced to, to find opportunities for students to work with these types of data and with the tools to generate things like machine learning uh, models. So, um, so you know, cloud-based infrastructure has been really useful in that context to kind of use virtual machines to, for students to access um, and make those as, you know, as available as possible. Um, that's one challenge being at the Smithsonian in terms of the kind of infrastructure limitations for having outsiders uh, take part. But um, yeah, so I see it as a big uh, plus that we're kind of all working from home is that there is a lot of uh, kind of increased, I would say, interest in working on the types of col um, collections and studies that I've been engaged with. Yeah, and, and building off of what Alex just said, uh, it, the digitization of these specimens, both plant and animal, has made uh, these collections widely available, not just to you know scientists, but the general public as well. So it's it's uh, useful to uh, encourage uh, people who previously might not have been interested in science or collections in particular to take a look and participate in research. And uh, many people have turned to kind of crowdsourcing platforms that, that by that kind of stuff, but there are also uh, other ways of doing that. And um, I, I see collections being a, a large part of my research continuing in, in kind of the aspects that I've shown today along phenology. Uh, uh, but, you know, they form the basis of our knowledge of everything we know about plants. So uh, if you're modeling the range of a species, that's Based, specimen based. Uh, if you're like Alex did, if you're trying to figure out how many species are along the equator versus in higher latitudes, that's that's specimens. Um, and I, I think in two ways, uh, one is my research would 
go up forward using data from these specimens and, and find how better to use them. But also the other avenue would be more along kind of Alex's research as in how do we get more data from these specimens, right? Is, is, you know, it could be location, date, shape, a plethora of things. And uh, for students wanting to get into this, I, I'd say you do need a composite of skills, right? You, you do need some background in, in if it's plant botany, you need to be identify important features. You need to be able to tell plants apart uh, but also uh, there needs to be some training in, in the kind of computer science uh, realm to make uh, use of this data. There's you know, the whole artificial intelligence, deep learning part of it, but even for more, dare I say, mundane or simpler tasks, there's a lot of background work that goes into the kind of informatics of data cleaning, standardizing and extracting uh, uh, that, and these are skills that, that people will need as we increasingly move towards uh, uh, research involving these digital resources and larger and larger data sets. Um, we actually have a question here kind of related to both some aspects of both of your research here, but kind of talking about in museums, how there's a lot of mislabeled um, taxonomic groups or just wrong taxonomy or misidentified um, specimens. Um, do you think machine learning or citizen scientist programs could be used to kind of help correct these identifications or where do you see um, that utility in kind of addressing this issue? Well, uh, I would say that machine learning can play a very big role in that part of uh, kind of curating collections, though, uh, one delicate part of that is um, kind of the, the uh, artificial intelligence portion, <laughs> which um, can also generate errors. So um, I think machine learning in all cases is something that really is a tool to be used in a setting where um, you know experts are able to evaluate the information that comes back to them. But I think uh, outlier detection or errors in data sets, I mean, there were actually a number of deep learning models that I built in order to just move through some of the steps that Daniel talked about in, in terms of data cleaning. So I, uh, you know, started with some, mil you know, over a million images that I uh, got uh, for this study and only ended up using about 500,000 of those images. So that kind of indicates that uh, deep learning really can be very useful for for, but I would say the sensitivity of the actual specimen record is also a very real thing. And to the extent that we integrate machine learning in that process of curating a, a collection where the records are you know, being kept um, and not manipulated a lot, uh, that still kind of remains a, a big part of, of what the future of museum science is. And, and with machine learning, the, the thing to, uh, uh, be careful of is, is it's learning the good stuff as well as the bad stuff. Uh, so for instance, when we were playing around with uh, uh, deep learning to uh, count flowers, fruits, and buds off specimens, I generated the bulk of the training data. So the, we joked that the uh, machine wasn't really learning how to count things, it was learning how to be Dan. And the resulting model would have been making all the mistakes I would have made when I was looking through those thousands of specimens. Uh, so when you're training the model, the if the identification of the species is wrong to begin with, uh, then the model will make those same mistakes. And definitely there is a, a possibility for crowdsourcing and citizen science to help as well. Uh, in fact, I think I've gotten a few comments when we were crowdsourcing specimens to uh, uh, the people who are just tasked to count flowers, fruits, and buds. I, did get a couple of emails saying that the specimen looked weird, right? And it's probably not what we think it is. And and uh, I think at least one of those cases it was true, was it was something that was labeled wrong. So definitely uh, showing it to more people uh, always helps, uh, be they experts or, or non-experts, because sometimes these things are really blatantly wrong. Like uh, you'll find things that uh, are were collected in New Zealand being labeled as collected in the United States, or you'll find, uh, you know, a grass specimen that has a tree label on it. So uh, crowdsourcing can help with those things as well. Yeah, and a follow-up question on a similar path to this. Um, so I think one kind of common thing we've heard from at least all the other speakers is kind of this idea of the extended specimen, you know, if they had this type of data, you know, what should we be keeping? 
Um, so I guess if, what is one piece of data or even a new type of data that you wish had been collected with the specimens that you work on? Um, and how can scientists generally improve data collection efforts? Well, I can say for me that, and this is of course kind of really relevant to what Dan pointed out, uh, which is, I really wish that each specimen actually had the very precise coordinates from where it was drawn. And that is something that we care about now. And I think there's no uh, good reason to say that it's something that we aren't working on. But if all of those specimens historically had those data, then there, there would be a different uh, kind of resolution from which we could really kind of study the diversity of a whole huge group, like thousands of species at once, because oftentimes the more recently collected things, they're just fewer in number or in terms of the species diversity, it's, it's not necessarily, yeah. I mean, Dan basically gave us the data for all of that, but that would be the thing that I would maybe, I, jumps out to me. <laughs> I agree 100% accurate location information. Uh, I, I definitely wish I had more. Uh, also, though it's it's slightly related, but not uh, often. Herbarium specimen labels will contain information about the area it was collected in and uh, what species it was co-occurring with. Uh, and sometimes that data can be really useful, but you don't see it in a lot of specimens. I mean, some, but enough, but not a lot. And and that would also be useful because you're getting multiple observations for the price of one, assuming the botanist was, knew what he or she was doing, because then you can say species A was here, but it was also co-occurring with species C, D, and E, which increases the amount of data uh, we can get from these specimens. Awesome, thank you. And I think we actually have a question from one of our panelists, Brad. Hi, uh, great talk, both of you. Yeah, I kind of wanted to follow up on that um, georeferencing question. So pre-1990 or 1980, there's this huge issue about how do we put a precise point on it. So, um, you know, I've seen all sorts of things done, just a, you know, a county centroid with no radius on an old, old uh, specimen or a, a point with a, a radius that's the county or a point with the radius that's the state. And, you know, I can imagine you can filter to some level on, well, if it's got a radius over a mile, don't use it or something like that. But what about all these specimens where someone just puts a point near the name of the town because that's all that there is on the label for a specimen from 1880. I'm just thinking like, how do we do a better job so that you can use that data or can we even do a better job or what would your recommendations be? I know it's a lot of different questions, but I think you probably get it. <laughs> right. Um, so even like you mentioned, even detecting these centroids are, are difficult because there's different kinds of centroids that are used as, as you, you just brought up. Uh, there are several R packages that help you do this. Um, one of them is like coordinate cleaner, I think, uh, from some folks at Q. It does a bunch of things, including querying administrative centroids, but the way it does it is it places it, I think, in like the smallest cell that in whatever resolution that is that includes the centroid. So it's not the exact geographic centroid. Uh, you could query databases to see if they follow uh, the coordinates fall on top in the center of townships, which is also often the case, and or museum and herbaria, which is uh, fairly common as well. The coordinate cleaner package takes care of a few of these things. And it interestingly, it does another thing where uh, it's looking for outliers, assuming you have enough data to do that, or you can uh, fairly simply do that on your own. So just uh, taking those coordinates, extracting the whatever climate, climate variables or environmental variables you're interested in, from those coordinates and then just, you know, plot them, uh, do uh, maybe a PCA plot or ordination plot like Alex showed us and see if there are any outliers and uh, excluding some of them could be useful. Of course, it's limited to when you have a lot of data. Um, as for things that were kind of estimated, it's hard, really hard to know. People do it various ways. Sometimes they the labels are really, really specific and you can almost accurately place uh, old specimens uh, down to like two decimal points. Uh, but then others are, people generally use some georeferencing software like uh, Geolocate, 
which gives you kind of a radius of probability and, and say, if you put in a description saying this was collected north of Route 25, south of wherever, and it kind of gives you a range of places where it might be. And, and many herbaria and curators use that kind of tool. So I guess there's not, you can try to reverse engineer that process, but uh, there's not a lot of uh, what things you can do. But I think the most basic thing to do is uh, look at the location data. Uh, where you have the state, you have the country, or you have the county or township, and look at the coordinates and make sure they match uh, for starters. And if they don't match, uh, you could either attempt to correct that or throw that data away. And then after that, you know, go through the more uh, the easier filters like uh, obvious centroids and obvious climatic outliers. Uh, and then depending on your data set, if it's worth it, you can go in and manually curate. But if not, I think that's about where it is. <laughs> Yeah, I will second Daniel and just say that um, coordinate cleaner is an incredible tool for for all the things that he described. I mean, it really is very useful for this purpose. And, and uh, you know, I, I I'm not working at the scale of counties and that uh, high high resolution, but even just with um, a kind of one degree map uh, cells, it's uh, incredibly useful. So, and and there are other choices. Should that not fit your needs, there are a bunch of other R packages that both official on CRAN and others that are just residing in on GitHub that can be used for these purposes. Awesome, thank you guys. <laughs> um, kind of moving towards a little bit more of a different topic, I figured we could ask an early kind of career question. So what do you think are some of the most beneficial steps you took in, in the later years of your PhD um, or your postdoc to getting to where you are now in this case? Well, I'll just say that I think the most beneficial thing for me was to be very open to acquiring new skills, even when I was a, a kind of in the later years of my PhD. Um, because even when I was finishing, uh, deep learning was something that you would hear people talk about, but uh, was not something that I knew anything about when I was finishing my PhD, um, deep learning in particular. So, um, so I would say, you know, just as a, a short response, the uh, ability or willingness to just kind of keep your skill set open to adding new things is probably going to uh, pay dividends in terms of what new opportunities open up for you um, as you move forward in your career, especially at the early stage. I mean, I would, I've, I've met Dan uh, through other things that would not have been uh, the case if I hadn't really kind of uh, gone down the path that I'm in with the data science lab. So that was kind of one example at least. I definitely agree, Alex. Uh, you know, my PhD work was on invasive species and I did use herbarium specimens, but they were mostly for getting DNA from. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I switched uh, kind of topics and skill sets as well along the line and, and definitely be open to new things. Uh, for those interested in, in faculty jobs, um, I think one, and this is, I don't know if this is really an answer, but I would advise like try every, do everything you can. Like the faculty hiring process is pretty opaque and no one really knows why someone gets hired and, and the other person doesn't. So you need to check all the boxes, right? Um, do your research, publish your papers, do the networking, you know, build, build your build your own homepage. I, I made one, but I didn't know if that helped or not, but it's one of the things that I had to check off my list, right? Um, so if there's things people say you need, um, at least give it a, give a thought about trying it because it you know might make the difference. I think also seeing a postdoc opportunities is not necessarily like if they don't necessarily like as Dan pointed out, they don't really overlap uh, uniquely with everything you've done up to that point. Trying to see it as an extension of where to take the things that you've done. To, into a new realm. Um, so it's kind of a variation of what I've already said, but I think, you know, seeing the connections between where you are and where you, you know, could find a new opportunity rather than seeing kind of a lack of opportunities that are directly related to skills you already have. I think that's a really important part about kind of making the steps um, beyond your PhD and, and through kind of a postdoc. And, you know, I'm not there yet, but uh, eventually to a faculty position or a permanent position. Mm -hmm. 
Awesome. Thank you, guys. And I guess uh, we can kind of finish on this last question here, kind of in general with your work when you're talking about machine learning um, for recognition in this case, um, some people might associate you know, facial recognition and not AIs and things like that. Um, so is that something that you've had to really kind of talk about when with your work and talking to the public about using, using you know, recognition software, AI and things like that? Uh, yeah, I would say that uh, facial recognition is one of the things that's probably the easiest thing to get people to understand about why these things are so useful for identifying features of things. Um, I think there's also a little bit of a, uh, um, uh, you know, not necessarily the type of topic that I'm so interested in, in and in particular, the deep learning scientists who are, are kind of investigating questions that I've kind of uh, talked about are, are often very interested in the shapes of faces, which can be a little bit uncomfortable because it's not really the, the avenue that, um, you know, I feel so comfortable saying, you know, that's the science I'm all about. Um, but um, in general, I think iNaturalist has really helped people um, and then, and kind of the apps that are, that, that are now kind of commonly available on your phone has helped it, uh, my, you know, me just being able to kind of quickly associate the work that I'm doing with something that people are more familiar with. I mean, your phone in general, just has so much, uh, you know, machine learning intelligence embedded in it right now. Um, most people, um, are more familiar with it now than they ever would have been three or four years ago. Right. And in general, with with our stuff with plants, you can you don't have to refer to facial recognition. We can we can make comparisons with uh, apps like uh, I forget what they're called, like Leaf Snap, or things like that, where you take an image of a plant on your phone outside and it tells you or tries to tell you what species it is. So we're we're for, far along enough that I think we our analogies can stay in the in the plant world or in the natural world. <laughs> Yeah, and the same is true uh, now uh, for a number of other groups and, and definitely for birds, you know, people who can mm -hmm. go outside and record a bird sound and then get a, um, you know, classification of that. I think, um, yeah, there's a lot of other natural history is kind of becoming something that people are really interested in now, I think, also during the pandemic, which has kind of driven people into their seclusion in the forest and, and experiencing some things that they otherwise have not, so. Right, well, thank you both. Um, we're almost at three here, so we'll start wrapping up. But thank you for both giving your talks and participating in today's panel. Uh, it was great to hear about both, both of what you guys are doing, especially with collections. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone else for coming here today um, and listening to these talks as well. I'm glad that you know after a year, we're able to actually host this um, with all of our original participants. Um, so next week, we have our fourth week of the ECSS, ECSS Symposium um, and our final week of early career speakers. I'm so looking forward to that and seeing everyone there. Take care, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Yeah, bye, everybody. <laughs>